The previous Olympic Games, the marathon was a long distance, it was 25 miles roughly, but when it came to Windsor Castle being involved as the centre stage for the Olympic Games, the idea was to start the race at Windsor Castle and finish at the White City Stadium. And the Queen and the King got heavily involved in the event, and essentially that distance was about 26 miles. And then inside the stadium, the idea of finishing in front of the Royal Box was mooted, which was obviously the best thing to do, and the athletes ran into the stadium, around the track and finished 385 yards from the entrance right in front of the Royal Box, a distance of 26 miles and 385 yards. And that distance has become the official distance of the marathon. There was a field of 55 runners from 16 nations, the most international of our events. I started the race at Windsor with the Royal Family. The event was so much anticipated because there'd been trials and tribulations and warfare, diplomatic incidents, battles between the Americans and the British. The Irish-American influence had been exerting itself hugely amongst the American, the American side of the things. On a hot afternoon on Friday, July the 24th, the runners started from Windsor in four rows. Many of them began at too fast a pace, and the heat of the day would soon take its toll. By Slough, the athletes began to struggle. But Hayes, who dropped back, kept to an even speed. He never bothered me. My grandfather and my father, they were both uh, bakers, and I used to work in the bakery as a boy. I'm used to the heat. In 1908, athletes did not know much about the physical aspects of running a marathon. But Lord Desborough ensured that doctors and nurses were appointed to attend the marathon runners during the course of the gruelling race. Because of the lack of knowledge about training and about how much running it is possible to do and to benefit from, an awful lot of energy was wasted worrying about things like style and diet. Some of the British athletes took a little meat extract, a banana, or a mouthful of rice pudding. But with the Americans and Canadians, however, they always had an orange as the most popular form of restorative. Most agreed, however, upon the value of a wet sponge passed over the head and at intervals during the race. Before starting, I had a light lunch consisting of two ounces of beef, uh, two slices of toast, and a sup of tea. During the race, I merely bathed my face in Florida water and I gargled my mouth with some brandy. But Durando's pre-race meal was a steak and a coffee. To assist them in the case of an emergency, all runners were provided with two attendants on bicycles, some of whom were Olympic competitors. Shoes were mostly in favour, but the Canadians did wear boots, as they claim it gives the ankle better support. This is Johnson, four miles. Yes. Every five minutes, the name of the leader was telephoned directly to the stadium and made known by men bearing large boards giving information. I've always called that marathon the biggest sporting event in history because of the crowds. The crowds were two or three deep, most of the way along the course, as far as we can tell from photographs of the time. So in spectator terms, if there were that many thousand people watching it, it was probably the biggest sporting event in history up to that date. At first, the British team was clearly leading. Charles Hefferon followed close by. Pietri maintaining a slow pace was far behind them. By Uxbridge, some of the athletes who had gone off at too fast a pace had either dropped out or slowed to a walk. There's lots of elements of the route that were based around English history and tradition. The most obvious was that they started it at Windsor Castle, uh, a castle since the Norman Conquest and a home of the royal family in 1908. And then they ran it past Eton and Harrow, two of Britain's oldest and most prestigious public schools. By 17 miles, Canadian Tom Longboat was in second place finding the heat unbearable soon after he was forced to stop. At 21 miles, only three runners were in contention, Durando Pietri, Johnny Hayes and Charles Hefferon. There were thousands and thousands of people on the route watching the event and they were supporting anything that wasn't American. So when Charles Hefferon of South Africa, part of the empire in those days, was leading for a lot of the distance, he was three minutes clear at 20, 20 miles, and the people in the stadium were getting the information that Hefferon was leading and that Durando Pietri from Italy was in second place. They, were, they, they realized then that the Americans weren't, weren't leading, weren't winning, weren't gonna win the race. 
and they sat in the stadium in anticipation. Heffron didn't arrive, he dropped out just before the stadium. The conditions of the race, the, the roads and the weather, etc., suited me exactly. Um, I should have won the event, but two miles from home, however, I accepted a draft of champagne. It was this mistake that cost me the race. Pietri and Hayes were now in the lead. I ran my own race throughout, covering in almost mechanical fashion the first five or six miles at a rate of six minutes per mile. After that, I ran as hard as I could to the finish. Ten miles from home, I, I was ten minutes behind the leader, and from then on, I just went through the field. In the final mile, having passed through Wilsdon, Pietri, exhausted, had the advantage. But the sight of the stadium lifted up his spirits. After one final great push, he staggered in, barely able to stand. Then, when I heard the people cheering, and I knew I had nearly won, a thrill of emotion passed through me, and I felt my strength growing. Dorando Petri, the tiny Italian guy, came into the stadium and the crowd went absolutely crazy, mainly because it wasn't an American. And then he set off on the track, and as soon as he got onto the track, he staggered and went the wrong way. and then picked himself up again and got going. And suddenly collapsed on the track. And at that point, the crowd were, they just couldn't believe what they were saying. Was a man lying there on the track? Was he dying in front of them? And then officials came to the, to the rescue, helped him, picked him up, took him further, and he ran on again. But then he staggered again and fell. I tried to struggle to the tape, but fell again. I never lost consciousness of what was going on, and if the doctors hadn't ordered the attendants to pick me up, I believe I could have finished unaided. 50 metres from the, from the finishing line, Durando Pietri collapses again, and at this point the stadium erupts because into the stadium, running solid and running steady, comes Johnny Hayes, the American. The, the result they didn't want, an American winner. So Durando Pietri then, the officials probably panicked a little and overreacted, and essentially picked him up and almost carried him over the finish line. So Durando Pietri crossed the finishing line first. He's the champion. As Hayes sprinted into the stadium, he realized that Pietri had beaten him to the finishing line. The marathon, it seemed, had a victor. Then rumors began to circulate that Durando Pietri was dead. He was in a state of absolute collapse, almost without a pulse. But after a short while, he recovered sufficiently to enter the stadium. And the officials scurried around and did as quickly as they could, erected the Italian flag, the Olympic champion, Durando Pietri, from Italy. The Americans were having none of that, though. They quickly protested, as they'd become accustomed to doing, and Durando Pietri was disqualified, and Johnny Hayes from the United States of America was declared the winner of the marathon. In the opinion of the judges, Durando Pietri would have been unable to finish the race without the help rendered on the track. I knew I was going to win. And I wish it had been 50 miles, not just 26. I've been training my legs for 10 years for a chance at the marathon. Although the American had been declared the winner, many marathon competitors chose to side with Pietri. Durando won. He deserves his victory. I'm not going to do anything to rob him of that. I'm not going to gain second place on the protest. Durando was the best man. Let the best man have the honour. No protest for me. But there's far more to the story of the marathon than the supposed victory of Johnny Hayes. Some of the officials who assisted Pietri over the finishing line were of Irish descent. As this contributed to his disqualification, there were suggestions that it may have been a plot to ensure that the second finisher, the Irish-American Johnny Hayes, gained the victory.